I've known David Cole for many years, and he has been litigating, writing, and researching civil rights, human rights, and civil liberties for all of that time. After graduating from Yale Law School, he was a law clerk for the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, and then became a staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, where he litigated, among other major cases, the flag-burning cases before the Supreme Court, Texas v. Johnson and United States v. Eichmann, which established that the First Amendment protects flag burning. He continues to litigate First Amendment and other constitutional and civil liberties issues as a cooperating attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights. He is now, however, full-time on the faculty of Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C. In addition to being a full-time law professor and a litigating attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights, David also has a prodigious output as what I would refer to as his, in his public intellectual role. He's legal affairs correspondent for the nation and a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books. He's also a commentator for National Public Radio, All Things Considered. And this tonight, uh, presenting Less Safe, Less Free, he's presenting his fourth book. His previous books are Enemy Aliens, published by the New Press in 2005, which he spoke about at an event on this campus in Rockefeller Chapel a couple of years ago. Prior to that, he, he wrote Terrorism in the Constitution, Sacrificing Civil Liberties for National Security, that also came out in its third edition in 2005, written with James Dempsey. And previous to that, he wrote No Equal Justice, Race and Class in the American Criminal Justice System. The only thing we have to wonder about David Cold, given both the quantity and very high quality of his output, is when the man sleeps. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce um, someone I'm proud to call friend and colleague, Professor David Cole. Thank you, Susan, for that uh, very nice and generous introduction. It reminds me of what uh, Justice Brennan used to say uh, when he got uh, nice and generous introductions. He'd say, I, wish, uh, I only wish that my parents had been here uh, to hear it. My father would have been proud. My mother would have believed it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly uh, uh, thankful to uh, the International House for, uh, for hosting me here and for uh, doing it in such a celebratory fashion. Uh, uh, when we walked in, Susan said, it looks like we're at a bar mitzvah. Um, so maybe this is my bar mitzvah speech. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, all right, I, I, um, uh, what, what I, what I want to uh, talk about is, is the, the, the strategy that the Bush administration has adopted and employed in the, uh, in the wake of 9-11 to respond to the threat of terrorism. We now have six years of um, sort of seeing how that strategy has played out, how it's uh, worked, and, uh, and, 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 and that's a, there's, a, there's a fair amount of evidence there. And so uh, this new book, Less Safe, Less Free, really um, uh, looks at that evidence carefully and concludes, as the title suggests, that uh, it's not working, that we are both uh, less safe, uh, uh, more vulnerable to terrorist attacks, and less free uh, because of the compromises that have been made in its name. We, we open the book with, um, uh, with a, uh, a reference to Minority Report, the Steven Spielberg film from a few years back, which is a sci uh, based on a science fiction short story by Philip K. Dick. Uh, and the movie, it's set in the not all that distant future in Washington, D.C., where we have finally, finally solved the problem of crime. And how have we done it? Uh, we have uh, some, somewhere identified three witches who can predict the future with uh, uncanny accuracy, captured them, uh, put them in the basement of the Justice Department. They predict who's going to commit crimes uh, with such, um, uh, such accuracy that Congress is convinced to pass a pre-crime law uh, that makes it a crime to intend to commit crime in the future. Uh, and then we can go out and arrest people for, before they've actually done anything based on their intentions. And this is all well and good until someone figures out a way to trick the witches into predicting uh, that the protagonist in the film will commit a murder that in fact he does not intend uh, uh, to commit. Now, we don't have uh, these witches in the Justice Department yet. Um, you know, I, I actually haven't been in there for six years, so I don't know. Uh, maybe they do, but um, 
Some people have uh, once thought that Karl Rove had this ability uh, to predict the future with un un uncanny accuracy, but the midterm elections seem to have disproven that. But nonetheless, the, the Bush administration's strategy in, in, in fighting the war on terror seems to be predicated on some notion that we have some uh, uh, ability to predict the future with sufficient accuracy to justify the imposition of harsh, coercive sanctions based uh, not on objective evidence of past wrongdoing, but based on predictions, necessarily speculative, uh, often predicated on inaccurate proxies, stereotypes, profiling, and the like, uh, about what people or what countries might do in the future. This strategy was, uh, was dubbed um, the preventive paradigm, or the paradigm of prevention, by John Ashcroft when he was attorney general before he stepped down, as David Letterman said, so he could spend more time spying on his family. Uh, and, and, and Ashcroft's argument was, you know, was, a, was a sympathetic one. He said, look, uh, if, if, when you're facing people who are willing to commit suicide to inflict uh, mass uh, casualties on innocent civilians, it's not enough to bring them to justice after the fact. They're dead. And so are lots of innocent civilians. We need to prevent the next terrorist attack from occurring. Uh, and of course, all of us share uh, that sense that we want to prevent the next terrorist attack from occurring. No one wants to live through another 9-11. But the administration's paradigm of prevention uh, takes the form of the justification of these harsh coercive methods uh, based on predictions about the future that are necessarily speculative. Uh, and so, so you get preventive detention where you round up people, lock them up, not based on they're having done something wrong that we've proved in the past and they're thereby justifying punishment, but based on prediction that, hey, this person might do something bad in the future, let's lock him up to keep him from doing something bad in the future. And we've seen mass preventive detention here in the United States in the wake of 9-11 and, of course, uh, at Guantanamo and elsewhere around the world in the war on terror. You see coercive interrogation, or as the rest of the world calls it, torture. Uh, the argument, if, if, you, if you look at the, the people who argue in favor of coercive interrogation or torture, um, the argument is always preventive. Nobody says it's justified to torture, to punish somebody after the fact, even if the somebody is clearly guilty of her heinous crimes. Torture is not acceptable as a punishment. Neither is it acceptable. Nobody, uh, as far as I can tell, argues that it's permissible as a way of investigating past crimes. Um, we haven't found the perpetrator, let's torture some people to see if we can find the perpetrator. No, the argument is always, there's a ticking time bomb out there, uh, we've got the person who knows where the bomb is, surely it's justified to torture him to prevent the bomb from going off. So in this context, the preventive paradigm makes thinkable what is otherwise unthinkable. Uh, and then, of course, there's preventive war. The doctrine developed in the run-up to the Iraq war that said, you know, international law rules about when a country can unilaterally go to war uh, don't make sense anymore. The international law on this subject says that a country can unilaterally attack another country only in self-defense. Only in self-defense, which means when you've been attacked, an objectively fair, verifiable fact, or when you face an imminent threat of attack, the troops are uh, you know, on the border. Uh, amassed on the border. Again, an objectively verifiable fact. And the Bush administration said in 2002, that, uh, that's not sufficient for us in the world of weapons of mass destruction, rogue states, and terrorists. We need to be able to unilaterally attack other countries based on predictions about what might happen at some point in the future. Not imminently, but at some point in the future. So uh, uh, we, we predicted uh, that um, uh, that, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, that he would uh, at some point might give them to Al-Qaeda, even though he had no uh, working relationship with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda might then turn around and use them against us, and that justified us in going to war unilaterally against the wishes of the Security Council uh, against a country that did not uh, threaten to attack us. Um, now, to, to make this a little bit more concrete, um, uh, to, I'll talk briefly about one of my clients, Maher Arar. Some of you may 
uh, know the name. Um, uh, some of you may know the story if you don't know the name. Uh, he's a Canadian citizen uh, who uh, was returning from a trip uh, in Europe back to Canada in uh, 2002, tra changing planes at JFK, when he was pulled out of line uh, in the transit area, uh, locked up for two weeks, interrogated uh, 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 at, at, at length. Uh, he, he was denied his request for a lawyer. When his family found that he didn't show up in Montreal, they hired a, a lawyer in Brooklyn for him, and the INS then lied to the lawyer to keep the lawyer away from him. He was then ordered deported based on secret evidence that he was a threat to national security. Uh, he said, well, how can I defend myself against secret evidence? But, you know, I wasn't actually trying to come to the United States anyway. Uh, I'm just trying to get to Canada, just changing planes here. Here's my connecting flight coupon. Uh, and they said, well, you know, you're not going to need that connecting flight coupon because we've chartered a federal jet for you. Uh, the only problem was the federal jet took him not to Montreal, but to Syria. Uh, and you've got to ask yourself, why would the United States take a Canadian citizen and forcibly redirect him to, to Syria, uh, except for the fact that Canada doesn't have a policy of torturing and detaining without charge uh, its suspects, and Syria does? Syria did. He was tortured uh, while being questioned with a dossier of questions identical to that which the U.S. officials used when they questioned him in Brooklyn. Uh, he was locked up for a year without charges, most of that time in a cell the size of a grave. Uh, and at the conclusion of that, of a year, a year in that kind of condition, the Syrians released him. Why? Because they found no evidence that he engaged in any wrongdoing, none whatsoever. He sent back to Canada. Canada has found no evidence that he's engaged in any wrongdoing. In fact, Canada launched a, multi, a, a, a lengthy, lengthy, uh, massive independent inquiry into this case chaired by a former uh, a justice of the Supreme Court, uh, wrote a report, a thousand-page report, on Canada's complicity in what, uh, what the United States and Syria did to this man. Uh, they fully exonerated Mr. Arar. They awarded him $10 million in damages. When we got the email uh, saying that uh, Maher had got $10 million in damages, my co-counsel, who works for a private corporate firm in, in New York, uh, immediately responded with an email saying, is that 10 million U.S. or 10 million Canadian? <laughs> to me, it was a lot either way, but, you know, if you're at one of those corporate firms, these things make a difference. Um, uh, Maher Arar, you know, I, I imagine some of you have heard of Maher Arar, but if, this, if we were in Canada, everyone in the room would have heard of Maher Arar. He is, his case sort of exemplifies for Canadians what the war on terror means, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, but, but Maher Arar was a victim of the preventive paradigm. We didn't have any evidence that he'd engaged in any kind of wrongdoing. If we had, we would have tried him criminally or sent him to Guantanamo. Uh, instead, we had vague suspicions that he might be a dangerous person. We couldn't uh, get the information we wanted by questioning him for two weeks, even by denying him a lawyer. We kept the lawyer out of the room because we didn't want to give him any kind of a fair process, and then we sent him to Syria to see what they could find out using uh, uh, the kinds of tactics that they are uh, so well known for. Uh, that's the preventive paradigm in action. Now, I want to make three points about the preventive paradigm um, uh, uh, tonight. Uh, the first is that it puts tremendous pressure on the values that we associate with uh, with our Constitution, with the rule of law, uh, with what makes uh, America great when, it's, uh, when it is at its best. Uh, the second is that while adopted in the name of securing our security, these measures have in fact uh, captured few actual terrorists, disrupted few actual plots, and have um, uh, actually, I think, rendered us more vulnerable to terrorist attack over the long term. And the third is that this is uh, these were unnecessary. That is, um, we're not against prevention. We're not against prevention. We're against the Bush administration's preventive <coughs> paradigm. Prevention uh, uh, can take all sorts of forms. Uh, I brush my teeth on a regular basis. I believe in prevention. Um, uh, uh, but the kind of preventive uh, measures that the Bush administration has emphasized, these highly coercive measures, uh, are particularly problematic and have caused uh, particular problems. So first, the sacrifices in terms of American values and the rule of law. And, and the reason that, this, that there are 
uh, it, it, the preventive paradigm pushes in, towards these sacrifices, these compromises, is because the rule of law is about constraining the state's use of coercive power. Right? We give the state a monopoly on legitimate coercive power, but what legitimates that coercive power is the notion that it is obligated to follow certain basic principles of the rule of law, uh, applied equally, applied in transparent fashion, through fair processes, checks and balances, uh, with, re with uh, 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 respect for basic human rights. But when you adopt the preventive paradigm, these things seem to get in the way. These notions, these fundamental values seem to get in the way of getting the job done, and so we have seen compromises in all of the most fundamental uh, commitments of the rule of law. So take equality. Uh, since 9-11, the administration has time and time again said to the American people, you know, you don't actually have to give up your liberty for a promise of greater security because we've got a better deal for you. We'll take away their liberty for your security. They being, of course, Arabs and Muslims, and especially Arab and Muslim foreign nationals. That's an easy way to strike the balance if you're a politician, because, of course, foreign nationals don't vote. Uh, and you can say to the voting uh, populace, you get your liberty and your security, too. Um, but it's an illegitimate way to strike that balance. And we have seen that time and time again. So. Uh, in, the, in the first uh, couple of years after 9-11, the government locked up in preventive detention over 5,000 foreign nationals. 5,000. Many of these people were arrested without any charges whatsoever and on flimsy bases. So, for example, uh, the Inspector General of the Justice Department did a report on this and they found that, as one example they, they gave, the FBI receives an anonymous call that there are too many Middle Easterners working at the convenience store down the street. So instead of saying thank you very much, hanging up and then focusing on you know, something that might actually help us, they send the FBI out to the convenience store, line up the Middle Easterners and then say, well, you know, th does he look like a terrorist? Can we rule out the possibility that this man is a terrorist? No, lock him up, lock him up. Then we'll figure out a charge uh, once we lock him up. Um, uh, and, and, and by the way, lock them up in secret because, because if Al-Qaeda finds out that we locked up this guy, they'll know that we're on to them. Or maybe they'll know that we're not on to them, but we don't want them to know anything so they were locked up in secret. So a, 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 a woman, the, the guy's wife calls the FBI that night and says, you know, look, my husband hasn't returned home. Do you have any record? Calls the local police, the INS. The official answer is no. We have no record of your husband, even, though, even if he's sitting in jail right behind the man on the phone, because by order of John Ashcroft, they were, the arrests were secret. Many of these people were eventually charged with some sort of immigration violation. They were tried in secret, hundreds of them tried in secret, closed hearings that no one was entitled to attend other than the, deta the detainee and his lawyer, not even family members, not even members of the press, not even human rights lawyers, not even members of Congress. John Conyers was barred at the door in Detroit when he sought to attend such a hearing. The, and the justification for this is, well, they're foreign nationals. They don't have the same rights as Americans. We can lock them up, then figure out what to charge them. We can detain them without showing that they're dangerous. Uh, we can presume they're guilty until they're proven innocent, rather than the other way around, because they're foreigners. Same argument made with respect to the people at Guantanamo. They don't have any rights because they're foreign nationals outside of our borders. Same argument made with respect to Mr. Arar when we filed a federal lawsuit challenging his treatment, saying it violates his constitutional rights to send him to another country to be tortured. They said, no, it doesn't because he's a Canadian and he doesn't have any constitutional rights. So, so much for uh, equality. Transparency. Well, we've had secret arrests. We've had secret trials. We've had disappearances into secret CIA black sites around the world. We've had the invocation of the state secrets privilege to block inquiry into unconstitutional action by our president. Another argument they made in Mr. Arar's case. Uh, even if we sent him to Syria to be tortured, even if he has constitutional rights, the court can't adjudicate the case because secrets are involved in the way that we treated Mr. Arar. And therefore, the case has to be dismissed uh, altogether. We've had essentially secret government. 
Uh, so so uh, the Bush administration has had uh, many setbacks on torture, right? It, 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 it authorizes broad torture uh, in secret. It becomes public. They retract that memo. Uh, they, they argue that they can inflict cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment on foreign nationals abroad because they're not entitled to the international human rights protections of the cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment prohibition. Uh, when Congress finds out about that, Congress says, no, uh, that doesn't sound right to us. An international human rights treaty protects everybody. And so they uh, almost unanimously reject the administration's view uh, that the cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment treaty doesn't apply to foreigners. Uh, and the administration then writes another secret memo saying, well, we've now reinterpreted what cruel and human and degrading treatment means. Continue your waterboarding. Continue uh, uh, your, your, your face slapping. Continue your exposure to uh, extremes of heat and cold. Continue your sleep deprivation. And do them in combination, because none of that, uh, we think, is cruel, inhuman, and degrading. But done in secret. We only learned about it in the last week because someone uh, told the New York Times about this still secret memo. Fair process. Fair pro the notion that the government, when it's using these coercive methods, has to have a fair process to make sure they're properly applied. Well, where's the fair process in the president's assertion of authority to detain enemy combatants? The argument made by the administration was the president can authorize uh, the, the arrest of anyone anywhere in the world, whether it's here at O'Hare Airport or in Afghanistan or Great Britain. Uh, and if the president labels that person an enemy combatant, or as President Bush put it more colloquially, uh, as he puts everything, uh, a bad guy, uh, <laughs> then you're, if you're a bad guy, then you're arrested uh, and held without charges, without trial, without access to court, without access to counsel, uh, indefinitely. So much for fair process. Checks and balances. Right, how, do you, how do you make a rule of law work in a, in a state, right? The state uh, is supposed to be restricted by the rule of law, but the state uh, has all the authority. So what do we do? We separate powers. We give the power of the court to check the other branches, Congress to check the other branches, the president to check the other branches. Uh, but this is not the view that the president takes. The president takes a view akin to that which was first articulated by one of our other great presidents, President Nixon. Who, um, who famously uh, defended his ordering of illegal warrantless wiretapping on Americans during the Vietnam War, sound familiar? Uh, when he was asked, why did he think he could do that by David Frost in the famous Frost-Nixon interview, uh, Richard Nixon said, well, my view was that if the president does it, that means it's not illegal. That's a direct quote. Now, President Nixon learned the hard way. That's actually not the American way of uh, law. But, but President Bush has, lar has, has essentially resurrected this notion, right? His, with a, one, one little tweak, he says, if the president does it and says the magic words, Dick Cheney, no, no, the magic words, <laughs> commander in chief, then that means it's not illegal. He's made that argument with respect to torture. Congress made it a crime to engage in torture under all circumstances, pursuant to an international treaty we signed that prohibits torture under all circumstances. The president took the position, well, that can't restrain me if, as commander in chief, I decide that the way to engage the enemy is to torture them. Same argument made with respect to uh, NSA warrantless wiretapping on Americans. Congress made it a crime to engage in warrantless wiretapping. The president says, well, that can't. Uh, apply to me as commander in chief because if I choose to engage in warrantless wiretapping on Americans as a way of engaging the enemy, that's my prerogative. No branch can check me. Uh, same argument the president made to the Supreme Court when the question was could the court review through habeas corpus the legality of the detentions at Guantanamo, the first case to go to the Supreme Court in the war on terror. And the president said, no, you can't review these cases. And the reason is it would be unconstitutional for you to review them because I have uncheckable, uncheckable authority to engage the enemy and therefore to hold the enemy. Uh, it would be unconstitutional for the court to review. Nine, all nine justices of the court rejected that view. Uh, but I guess if your view is that you have uncheckable authority, it doesn't matter if all nine justices of the Supreme Court uh, take a different uh, view. Finally, basic human rights. Um, here, you know, I don't need to make a, a lengthy argument. I think you just need to think of two images, Guantanamo on the one hand and Abu Ghraib on the other. Images 
for which the United States is probably better known around the world today than the Statue of Liberty. Now, when I um, make these um, uh, uh, complaints in debates with my friends in Washington who defend the administration, it's a smaller group, smaller and smaller group who defend the administration, but there still are some, they inevitably make a response along the lines uh, of one that my colleague Viet Dinh, the author of the Patriot Act, uh, once said to me in a debate. He said, David, you're so September 10th. And what he meant by that was, I love that line, but what he meant by that was, uh, was, you know, of course we've had to make some different choices, some different trade-offs. We've had to, 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 you know, we've had to make some compromises. Why? Because we're in a new world. Uh, we have greater security threats than we thought we had before, and we need to make these different compromises for our security. So here's the less safe part of the talk. How, 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 what's the record on whether we are, in fact, safer? Well, a couple of years ago, the State Department issued a report and said worldwide terrorist incidents have dropped in the past year. And Richard Armitage said, came out and said, see, the global war on terror is working. Until two months later, when Colin Powell had to come out and, and admit uh, that they had miscounted. And that actually, when you did a full accurate count, the number of terrorist incidents had increased, not decreased. And in fact, every year since 9-11, the number of terrorist incidents has increased in both frequency and lethality. Uh, meanwhile, Al-Qaeda has fully reconstituted itself in the border of Pakistan. And whole new terrorist groups have sprung up out of nowhere uh, in response to our response uh, to the attacks of 9-11. In Iraq, uh, most uh, obviously, but not only in Iraq, in, 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 in Great Britain, in Madrid, in Germany, um, uh, groups uh, un, 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 unaffiliated but, uh, but inspired uh, by uh, animus against the United States. And these groups are even harder uh, to, uh, to track down than, than Al-Qaeda itself because they're so dispersed, so anonymous and the like. Um, but but the good news is we haven't had a terrorist incident in the United States since 9-11. And that's the Bush administration's big argument, right? Um, whenever I hear that argument, it calls to mind for me Tom Ridge's speech when he stepped down as the um, home, head of Homeland Security. And he, he made that claim. And then he knocked on the podium. And that night, John Stewart played that clip on The Daily Show. And he said, did I just see the leader of Homeland Security for the most powerful country in the world knocking on wood? <laughs> and indeed he did, and indeed Tom Ridge may as well have been knocking on wood given what their Homeland Security measures have, have achieved in terms of actual terrorists uh, uh, captured. So take those 5,000 foreign nationals detained in preventive detention measures in the first two years after 9-11. How many of them today stand convicted of a terrorist offense? Zero. Zero for 5,000. Take the 8,000 young men from Arab and Muslim countries who the FBI sought out for interviews after 9-11 on the theory that, you know, hey, we don't know much about Al-Qaeda, but we do know that they're uh, male Arab and Muslim foreign nationals, so let's just interview them all. Uh, maybe we'll find a terrorist. How many stand convicted of a terrorist offense? Zero. Zero for 8,000. Uh, or uh, then, then they went broader. They said, well, let's call in every man uh, from a f a foreign national, uh, from an Arab or Muslim country, and, and require them to go in for special registration, fingerprinting, photographing, interviews by INS. Again, maybe we'll find a terrorist. 82 to 83,000 uh, called in under that program. Again, not a single one convicted of a terrorist offense. Together, this campaign, the most extensive campaign of ethnic profiling that the federal government has engaged in since World War II with the Japanese internment, the government's record is zero for 95,000. Now, they don't put that statistic up on their uh, website on how they're doing in the war on terror. I don't know why, I, you know, but they don't. Instead, they put up other statistics, like we've indicted over 400 people in terrorism-related cases. We've convicted over 200 of those. Well, that sounds like a lot of terrorists, right? 400 people indicted in terrorism-related cases? Well, thank God someone's doing their, doing their homework. Um, but, what it, but, but, but when you look at those, it turns out that the key word there is related, not terrorism. 
uh, and that, that the vast majority of these cases actually have nothing to do with terrorism. There's no terrorism charge in them whatsoever. The, the, the balloons are rising. Um, uh, the, 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 most of these cases are for minor offenses like um, credit card fraud or check fraud or filling out a federal form falsely or lying to an FBI agent or not doing your reading for class, you know, those kinds of things, <laughs> not terrorism. The Inspector General issued a report this year saying, ca castigating the Justice Department for labeling cases as terrorism related that had not one word about terrorism in them. The Washington Post looked at all the convictions, all the convictions, and found that only 39 of them actually had a terrorist charge in them. Only 39. And we look at those 39 and find that virtually all of them are under this extremely broad terrorism statute that allows the government to get a terrorism conviction without showing that an individual engaged in any terrorist activity, that an individual conspired to engage in any terrorist activity, that he aided or abetted any terrorist activity, that he intended to further any terrorist activity, uh, it's called the Material Support for Terrorist Organization Statute, and essentially is a guilt by association statute. What they do is they, they designate certain groups as terrorists, and then anything that anyone does in, for the benefit of or in support of one of those groups, regardless of its character, regardless of its intent, regardless of whether it has anything to do with terrorism, is a terrorism crime. So the vast majority of even the terrorist convictions are not for terrorist acts. The only, about the only person convicted of, a terror, of an attempted terrorist act since 9-11 in the United States is Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. And he, of course, was not captured by any brilliant preventive paradigm strategy of John Ashcroft, um, but because an uh, alert airline attendant saw this strange looking guy trying to light his shoe. Uh, Six years we've had of incredible focus on the Arab and Muslim communities, and we have not yet identified a single Al-Qaeda terror cell in the United States, not one. Meanwhile, at Guantanamo, where we had 770 people, uh, we're told they're the worst of the worst. We're told by General Myers when they were first brought there, these are the kind of people who would chew the cables on their transport planes to bring them down if we didn't tie them down. That's how bad they are. Well, now we know, six years later, uh, that over half of them have been released, suggesting maybe they weren't the worst of the worst uh, to begin with, and that the military's own tribunals have categorized only 8% of the Guantanamo detainees as fighters for al-Qaeda uh, or the Taliban. Now, I don't want to suggest that that we are in no respect safer. Uh, I think there have been measures that have increased security. Uh, airport security is certainly uh, better than it was uh, uh, before 9-11. Uh, Border security is better than it was uh, before 9-11. Uh, uh, information sharing between law enforcement and intelligence is better than it was before 9-11. Uh, uh, and I think that the, the uh, military's response uh, to the Taliban's refusal to turn over uh, 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 Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda after 9-11 can take some credit for the fact that there was not a follow-on attack. We, 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 we closed their training camps. We closed their headquarters. We captured or killed many of their leaders. We g captured laptops and other information that led us to uh, still other um, uh, top people uh, in Al-Qaeda, but note that that was not a preventive paradigm measure. Uh, that was a traditional, lawful um, act of self-defense. The UN treated it as such, NATO treated it as such, 120 na nations signed on. Um, but then compare that, uh, compare that, an armed attack in response to an armed attack uh, after the Taliban refused to turn over the perpetrators. Compare that to uh, Iraq, where we went to war against a country which, which, which didn't attack us, which didn't threaten us, against the will of the UN, against the will of the Security Council, against the will of the world, without any real support other than, uh, other than Great Britain, um, which until recently would support us on anything we did. Um, uh, and and, and what, ha what has come of that, that preventive war? Well, 
We, yeah, we may have closed down the training camps in Afghanistan, but we gave them the best possible training ground in Iraq, the real thing. We've inspired more terrorists to join the cause uh, by going to Iraq and, and taking action uh, against us. We've sacrificed tens of thousands of American and Iraqi lives. To what end? To what end? $450 billion, far outpacing all the money we've spent on homeland security. $450 billion thus far uh, in the war on terror. The, president, the Bush administration fired a guy for estimating that the um, Iraq war might cost $100 billion. Uh, it's already cost us $450 billion. Uh, and, and of course, these measures, not just the Iraq war, but all of these measures, these shortcuts on the rule of law, this notion that we can do to them what we would not tolerate being done to us, that the Muslim and Arab communities are presumptively suspect until we prove them innocent. Uh, these measures have forfeited the legitimacy of our enterprise. And when you forfeit the legitimacy of your enterprise, you do two things. You make it more difficult to get the cooperation you need to find the actual terrorists. Who's going to come forward from the Arab and Muslim communities to provide help when they fear that they're going to be locked up if they appear on the radar screen? Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 these measures against foreign nationals in the United States, they get some attention here. Maher Arar was on the front page of the New York Times at least once. Uh, Bob Herbert wrote some columns about him. Some of you in this room, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a small number of you, um, have heard of him. Uh, but again, in Canada, everyone's heard of him. And in each of the countries that the foreign nationals that we have abused comes from, their cases are major stories. And they represent for them the way the United States is responding in the war on terror. And that makes it much more difficult to get the cooperation we need. There was a story in the Times yesterday, India is, gonna, is threatening now to back out of an agreement on restricting nuclear development there. Why? Because the government is afraid of being seen by the people as too allied with the United States. Uh, that's a disaster. And at the same time, the, when you forfeit the legitimacy of the enterprise, you give Al-Qaeda exactly what it wanted, uh, exactly what it needed. It, 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 Mark Danner in the New York Review uh, once wrote, you know, if Al-Qaeda had gone to Madison Avenue and gathered the, all the best minds on Madison Avenue and said, come up with you know, a, a week-long retreat, your, your job, come up with the best possible recruiting campaign we can, we can muster. They never could have come up with anything half as good as Abu Ghraib. And we gave it to them. So the, the tragedy here is that all of this was unnecessary. There are plenty of ways to prevent terrorism uh, without uh, employing these highly controversial coercive measures that have the kind of blowback effects that uh, that we see in the rising anti-Americanism around the world. The 9-11 Commission recommended 42 such measures. It's a bipartisan group, no ax to grind. 42 measures, things like safeguarding nuclear stockpiles in the former Soviet Union, uh, screening uh, cargo on passenger planes, not just passengers, better screening of containers coming into shipping ports. We only screen about 5%. Uh, better uh, foreign relations strategy in which we assert our authority around the world through public diplomacy and foreign aid rather than through military might. We have our military budget dwarfs that of the next 10 countries combined, uh, while our foreign aid is uh, one of the lowest per capita in the world. Support moderate Muslims. Uh, instead of treating Mus the Muslim community as suspect um, uh, uh, because they are uh, Muslim. Uh, do something to try to, to, to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict instead of um, backing the Israelis uh, 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 to the hilt. And use the rule of law as, a, as an asset, not treat it as an obstacle in fighting uh, terror. The rule of law gives you all sorts of, uh, of, of measures to protect yourself against people who commit the kinds of atrocities uh, that Al-Qaeda commits. Um, but you got to act within that framework. And the 9-11 the Commission came out with a report uh, a couple of years ago on how, report card on how the administration was doing in terms of these non-controversial um, preventive measures that actually have some chance of increasing our security over the long term. And it's, and, you know, it's no report card uh, I, can ass I, I assume that anyone in this room ever got or you wouldn't be here. And it's no report card you ever want to see your child come home with, and in the day, these days of great inflation, you probably never would. 
Uh, they had five Fs, eight Ds, 11 Cs, one A minus. So while the administration is talking tough, acting tough, uh, it's in, in ineffectual ways that have counterproductive uh, consequences. It is uh, disregarding uh, the much more sensible measures uh, that it could and should employ. Now I want to close on a somewhat more positive note because otherwise, you know, because you know, I have to do something with all these balloons here. Um, <laughs> A couple of years ago, I was in Berlin at a conference on 9-11, and an Israeli philosopher by the name of Avishai Margalit gave a speech, a very, 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 very dark speech about 9-11. About at the end of it, he said, uh, if I were in America, I would feel the need to end on a note of optimism. But I'm an Israeli, and I'm in Berlin, so I'm done. <laughs> So, but I'm in America, and, and I, you know, and here we are. We have these beautiful balloons. 75th anniversary of the International House uh, in the heartland of Chicago, and, and 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 actually, I think there is some reason for uh, for hope, some reason for um, uh, for 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 optimism, and that is this: If you went back to 9/11, 2001, and you imagine somebody coming up to you and saying, you know what, the United States is not going to be able to do whatever it wants in responding to this attack. Uh, you know, you would have said, who's going to stop them? Right? Who's going to stop us? We're the most powerful country in the world. There's no other uh, countervailing superpower. Uh, this group is one of the most hideous uh, organizations which has just committed one of the most horrific uh, uh, acts of terrorism that the, that the world has ever known. Who's going to stop us? And yet, I think now, six years later, if you think back, in fact, the administration has been forced to retreat on many of its most extreme assaults on the rule of law. So the torture memo, defining torture down so it only uh, amounted to physical pain at the level of organ failure or death. Once that becomes public, the administration is forced to retract it. This view that cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment doesn't apply to foreign nationals. Once that becomes public, uh, the Congress forces the administration to uh, uh, retract it. Uh, when, when the administration says, there are no laws at Guantanamo, the Supreme Court says, no, law applies there. When the administration says, even US citizens can be locked up as enemy combatants without any hearing whatsoever, the Supreme Court says, no, have to give them a hearing. Uh, when, this, when the administration says the president can create military tribunals in which people can be executed on the basis of secret evidence in violation of the Geneva Conventions, because the Geneva Conventions don't apply uh, in the war on terror, the Supreme Court says no. Geneva Conventions do apply, and the president cannot unilaterally create such tribunals. Uh, when the, uh, uh, the administration adopts an illegal NSA warrantless wiretapping program in secret, when it becomes public, lawsuits are filed, a federal court declares the program unconstitutional, the government appeals, but then uh, announces that it's actually terminated the program and is now proceeding through the very law that it previously said it couldn't be bound by. So time and again, the administration has been forced to retreat. And compare that to other administrations in other times of national security crisis, taking uh, similarly extreme measures. Roosevelt, the internment of the Japanese during World War II. The trial and execution of enemy combatants in a kangaroo court in, the, in, a, in a secret room in the Justice Department in World War II. Um, uh, the, in World War I, locking up thousands of people for merely speaking out against the war affirmed repeatedly by the Supreme Court. The McCarthy era, uh, where people were thrown in jail for their mere associations, affirmed by the Supreme Court, uh, until McCarthy was, had been censored and the uh, era was on the wane when the court started to say uh, this was wrong. So by comparison, uh, there's been much more pushback much more pushback. And you know, you might attribute that to the fact that President Bush has, has taken more extreme actions. Uh, but I'm not sure that they're more extreme than interning 120,000 people simply because of their uh, ethnicity, as FDR did during World War II. Uh, I actually attribute it to the, um, to the work of civil society uh, in the United States and around the world. The civil society sector 
uh, in this time and era is very strong. And it has provided the check that Congress has failed to provide. It has written reports. It has filed lawsuits. It has organized citizens. It has organized the world. Uh, uh, it has stood up for the values that we stand for uh, at our best. Uh, and in doing so, um, it has, I think, given backbone to the media, which has then risked criminal prosecution to disclose uh, some of the, uh, the, the worst abuses that the administration has perpetrated in the name of our security. And it has given backbone to the court, uh, which has, for the first time ever, stood up to a president during an ongoing national security crisis. Um, uh, so, uh, so let me close with a quote from a book. Um, it's a book by two, um, well, at the time, they were Harvard uh, professors, Cornell West and Roberto Unger. Cornell West, I think, is now at Princeton. But they wrote a book uh, some years ago called The Future of American Progressivism. Uh, and it was a disturbingly thin book. Um, you know, it, physically, not in terms of its ideas. Uh, but it did contain, I think, a very uh, important uh, thought about the relationship between hope and action. And I want to leave you with that thought. Weston Unger wrote, hope is more the consequence of action than its cause. As the experience of the spectator favors fatalism, so the experience of the agent produces hope. And what they mean by that, of course, is that people don't act, don't stand up, don't get involved because they happen to be optimistic or have hope. But that they develop hope and faith and optimism by acting, by getting engaged, by standing up. So my own hope is that you will be the next uh, generation of agents of hope. And through your actions, you will create not just a basis for hope, but a basis for change. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful exposition. Thank you. Uh, on the topic of Harvard professors, there's another Harvard professor of law, I forget his name at the moment, <laughs> who has a very interesting scenario that a terrorist has a nuclear device about to go off in probably the heart of New York City, and it's about to go off in two hours. And the only way we can find the information out is through extreme interrogation techniques. Uh, now, my, I'm not a professor of law, but I personally think he's been watching too many James Bond movies. How would you comment on that? Uh, well, um, yeah, that's, that is the ticking time bomb scenario that I alluded to in my, in my opening. And it is the common defense of, ter of torture and coercive uh, interrogation tactics. When President Bush has defended it, he said, we've prevented terrorist attacks from occurring. He never really identifies uh, any real terrorist attacks that they've prevented, but he claim makes that claim. So the question is, what do you, how do you do, you know, how do you respond to the, t the ticking time bomb? I think, you know, first response is, um, this is a, um, a uh, uh, chestnut of, of philosophy uh, uh, classes, uh, and it uh, should be uh, left to philosophy classes. It, is, it doesn't have any um, real application to the real world. That is, uh, the, the circumstances in which one might make the claim, if you're a utilitarian, that it makes sense to punish some, to, 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 to torture someone temporarily, inflicting pain on that person, to save the lives of, say, one or ten or a hundred or a thousand or a million people, um, require uh, that uh, uh, you know that this is the person who planted the bomb, you know that the bomb is about to go off. You know that there's no other way that you can get that information. You know that if you torture him, he will tell you the truth. Now, in fact, you never know uh, virtually any of that information. And so in the real world, the ticking time bomb situation does not arise. There's not been a single, I mean, we've had, uh, I don't know how many accounts of torture inflicted at Guantanamo, at Abu Ghraib, and CIA black sites, uh, and not one of them. Not one of them is a ticking time bomb scenario situation. So in the real world, it's a very, very different kind of a, of a question. Secondly, the question is, you know, even if you accept for, for, the, for the moment that one could make an argument that on, a, on utilitarian grounds, it makes sense to, you know, a little bit of pain saving a lot of death, 
uh, uh, from occurring. Uh, the, the, the question is, what do you do about that? How should we best deal with that? And the Harvard professor, Alan Dershowitz, says, well, the way we ought to deal with that is by creating a system for uh, torture warrants, where we allow people to go to judges and, and, and say, look, you know, this is the ticking time bomb situation. Give me a warrant that allows me to torture. I, I don't think that's right. I don't think we want to set up a system that legitimates and legalizes torture on the basis of some extreme hypothetical that's likely never to occur in the real world. Uh, I think it's far better to adopt an absolute prohibition, as the world has done, as we have done in the Convention Against Torture, uh, si signed by virtually every country in the world. And then when, if such an extraordinary cir circumstance ever arises, one can deal with it after the fact. Uh, if somebody uh, uh, decides that this is the moment where, you know, that really it's justified, there is no other way, we, 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 we're going to find out where this bomb uh, is, and they defuse the bomb and they save millions of lives, they can argue after the fact, you ought not prosecute me. Even though it was illegal, it was justified. As President Lincoln argued with respect to um, suspending habeas corpus, even though it was illegal, uh, it was justified because of the emergency uh, situation. That was a political argument, uh, not a legal argument. And, 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 and there's all sorts of, of room in the, in the legal process for recognizing that we don't necessarily prosecute every crime that's committed. We don't actually convict every uh, criminal who has committed a crime. So we allow prosecutors not to prosecute. We allow jurors to acquit, even where the evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is guilty. Uh, we allow presidents to pardon uh, without any criteria whatsoever. So there's plenty of discretion left in the system. We can keep the prohibition absolute. We should if we water it down uh, in the name of this abstract hypothetical. What we'll get is Abu Ghraib. Hi, thank you for this uh, beautiful speech. I wish you have more people like you. Uh, maybe it will uh, help Fox News to change to Dove News. Uh, my question is, what will you do about that uh, case, uh, about the German guy who was uh, uh, kidnapped, and there's yeah. other cases like him, you know, right. by the CIA, but yet you have this uh, Justice Department who refused to look in his case. Right. Mr. al yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. al case is very much like Mr. Arar's case, right? He is, Mr. al is a, another innocent person. He happened to share a name with a terrorist we were looking for. He wasn't the terrorist we were looking for, but we thought he was because he had the same name. So what did we do? We kidnapped him while he was on vacation in Macedonia, rendered him to Afghanistan, tortured him. Uh, when when um, we didn't find anything out about him and, we, and we, we realized some months later that it was a case of mistaken identity, uh, Condoleezza Rice said, we've got to release him. And so they dropped him on an uh, abandoned side of the road in Albania. That's how we treat people uh, in the preventive paradigm. And, and, and when he brought a lawsuit to challenge the constitutionality of what we did to him, uh, the administration argued, as they have in the Arar case, uh, that, that uh, you know, what we did to Mr. al is, is involved secrets. The negotiations we had, if any, with Macedonia or, or Afghanistan or whoever, uh, Germany, what have you, uh, are secret. And therefore, you can't litigate the case. There can be no accounting uh, 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 for, for justice, no justice for Mr. al uh, And the Fourth Circuit, the most conservative court in the country, accepted that argument. And the Supreme Court uh, recently refused to hear the case. So he gets no justice to the judicial system, none whatsoever. I think, you know, that if we are going to have any chance of turning around the, um, the, the, the fallen image of the United States around the world on human rights, we have to give people like that justice. We have to recognize that when we've made mistakes and, 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 uh, and violated basic human rights of innocent people, we have to provide them with some sort of justice. Canada was able to do it with Mr. Arar uh, to, to launch a massive investigation to award him uh, uh, damages, and yet we have refused to have any kind of serious independent uh, investigation of any of the torture victims, from Mr. al Masri to Mr. Arar to all the people at uh, at Abu Ghraib. And until we do so, um, we will not uh, recover our standing 
uh, in, in the world. And, and until we do so, we will continue to inspire the kind of anti-Americanism that is the greatest threat to our national security as we go forward. David, could I interrupt with a follow-up question? Couldn't Congress create a remedy for people who were harmed by extraordinary rendition? In other words, the courts won't do anything because they say we can't litigate it. Um, there's problems about things happening beyond our territorial jurisdiction, but Congress could create, I mean, that's what happened in Canada. Well, Their yeah. parliament acted no, yeah, to Congress, create compensation for Mayor Harrell. Right, right. Congress could provide a remedy, and Congress, in fact, has provided a remedy. They call it the Torture Victim Protection Act. But the government says, well, even if we violate that act, um, because it's a secret, you can't adjudicate it. Congress could also um, uh, amend or, 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 or uh, adjust, legislate on the subject of the state secrets privilege, which is a judicially created doctrine, and which at, as in its current manifestation, sort of without thinking about it, elevates secrecy over all other values. Right? So no matter what the constitutional complaint made, if the government says it's a secret what we did, that's the end of the case. Uh, that, it seems to me secrecy is a legitimate interest of the government in, in, in times of crisis, even in non-times of crisis. There's got to be uh, a, a room for secrecy, but it's, not, it's just one value. It's not the, the uber value, and, 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 and you have to weigh it against other values. And it think, seems to me that when you're talking about torture versus secrecy, uh, it's, it's not at all obvious that, that secrecy should win out. Yeah. Yes, just uh, two questions. The first one, uh, you spoke about the pressure that uh, the strategy on the war on terror has put on the uh, rule of law in the States. Yeah. But the point for me is that the pressure was on the rule of law everywhere in the world, especially in the Western country, it's because I remember very well, and I think this is a very hard to say, the very short and violent discussion that it was be before the war to build the coalition in Europe and in the Western countries in general. The point is, was, uh, uh, do you believe that this war is uh, necessary, that there is evidence for the, this war? This was not the question. The question was, are you a friend of the United States of America or not? So you are a friend of us, you have to be in this war if you don't come. You, are, uh, you don't have the courage or you're a part of the old and aged Europe. This is the first question. So everything has changed in the world from this point. The second point is uh, you said that uh, the strategy of this administration wasn't successful in fighting terror, okay. But in a way it was successful, I think, because fear is a very strong instrument of power since the world is, I mean, and a sign that this strategy was, when, when you make people having fear, you get consensus. Because uh, when you say, I will protect you, 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 you take their, their consensus. And the sign is that this administration has won the last elections. Thank you. OK, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the first question, you know, actually, I think there's a lot of disagreement around the world on what's the appropriate way to respond to terrorism. And, uh, and, 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 and in fact, the, the most common criticism you hear in Europe about the way we responded is that we called it a war on terror. And that we, and, and, and you know, so, so the Brits say, for example, you know, the IRA, for 30 years, the IRA wanted us to call it a war. They wanted us to make them warriors. That's, that's what they want. They wanted the renown of being warriors. And we refused to call it a war. Uh, calling it a war uh, is, is, is the wrong way to go. That's sort of the, f that's the starting point for most uh, European uh, responses. And I think in part that comes from their having had more experience in fighting terrorism than we did. I mean, the UK, uh, when it initially responded to the IRA, responded much like we did. They authorized internment without trial, coercive interrogation and torture. What they found was that it didn't work, that it only made the IRA more sympathetic in the eyes of, uh, of, of, the, of the ordinary Irishman and, and strengthened their position, not weakened their position. Uh, and indeed, that, the way democracies defeat terrorism is by isolating the terrorists from their potential communities of support. But when you take these kinds of measures, you reinforce uh, support for, for Al-Qaeda among those potential communities of support. So I actually think there's a lot of disagreement around the world. There's huge criticism of the United States uh, in, in virtually every country in terms of how it has responded. Um, so, I, so I don't, you know, and I think, I think one can learn lessons from the way, from these mistakes. As to fear and power, uh, absolutely. Um, 
that's true. Uh, it's true no matter who's in power. It's, it, you know, it, 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 that's just a, a fact of life. It's one of the reasons that democracies overreact uh, in times of crisis. And again, you know, I don't think this is a Republican-Democrat thing. I don't think it's a U.S., other countries kind of thing. I think this is an uh, unfortunate uh, a fact of, de of, of democratic societies, that they respond by demanding security, uh, and particularly at the expense of those who don't have a voice, of minorities or the, dis uh, the, the disempowered. Uh, and, 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 and so, um, so you know, that this, this happens. And, and the question is, how do you build up the constraints to ensure that it doesn't happen? Uh, and I think you do it by, you know, by insisting on uh, constitutional principle. You do it by insisting on the basic values of the rule of law that we set up to try to regulate this, uh, this reaction, which we foresee is going to happen. That's why we have a constitution. Uh, it, doesn't it doesn't work, however, unless people stand up and organize and speak out for those constitutional rights. Um, in order to uh, make sure that David has enough time to sign books, um, we have, what are there, six people up at the mic? Let me take three and three. Let's say, yeah, if uh, that's it, you're the last person, the last person in line. And what we should do is the first three people should each come up and briefly state their question. And then David probably can formulate an answer that bridges the issues you raise. And then we'll have the next three as a group. So. Yep, that's great. Adelante. <laughs> I just throw a little wrench into that. Bruce Fine, who was an assistant secretary um, for the attorney general for Reagan, right. says that, that in the case of the El Masri, that uh, Congress has the ability to cut off funding for that specific sort of Oh, yeah, thing. for renditions, right. right. Um, but anyway, uh, my, when, uh, I'm part of a coalition that, that uh, fought the Patriot Act from the very beginning. And, you know, basically that it was completely unnecessary. And you were saying, I'm not sure if I understand your, your, what you're trying to say here, but you said that the rule of law gives much yeah. ammunition to, the, uh, to fighting terrorism because we thought terrorism was a crime to begin with. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's, uh, you know, we wanted to, we needed more, you know, I would like people to understand a little bit better the fact, that fact that before the, these various attacks on civil liberties occurred, you already had laws which you could, you yeah. had the FISA okay. courts and you know, okay. stuff like that. All right, so. great. Rochelle? Hi, thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, I'm just thinking about what you said about the crime of material support to terrorist organizations, and I was wondering if you could speak to the process of how the administration deems an organization, a terrorist organization, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of standards do they apply? How can they make the Iranian Revolutionary Guard a terrorist organization, but not Human Rights Watch a terrorist organization, because I'm sure some of them would like to. Um, and then how does that process affect um, our civil liberties and our safety? Okay, great. Next. You seem to have a great deal of faith in civil society, yeah. and I'm wondering uh, how you suggest uh, we can uh, strengthen civil society in America today, and uh, will that be enough? Uh, what else do we need to uh, yeah. address? Okay. Thank you. All right, great. Um, uh, the, um, when, I was on the, when I was on the teaching market, you know, inevitably when you give a job talk, the first professor who raises his hand says, I have a three-part question, you know, and then you listen to it, and by the time you're at the part three, you can never remember part one. So, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm being challenged in that same way. Um, the, yeah, so, sure, we had, we had many laws uh, on the books before 9-11 that gave the government power to respond to terrorism. Much of, not all, but much of the Patriot Act was unnecessary uh, and was, uh, and, and simply took away uh, checks that were designed to ensure that these m methods were used against people where there was probable cause to believe they were engaged in terrorism and not just people who happened to be Arab or Muslim uh, uh, or, 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 or the like. And, 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 and I mean that, and we, we talk in our book about you know, the rule of law as an asset rather than an obstacle in fighting terrorism. And I think uh, there are plenty of ways. I mean, the rule of law is not designed to sort of turn a blind eye to terrorists. Uh, it treats them as criminals. It gives the state the authority to act effectively against them. But you've got to follow the basic rules. Even in wartime, 
you got to follow the basic rules. Had we followed the basic rules at Guantanamo, given people hearings uh, uh, to determine whether they were in fact al-Qaeda fighters, uh, treated them humanely instead of subjecting them to torture, uh, and, and asserted only the power to hold them for the conflict with al-Qaeda, not, or Afghanistan, not for the duration of the worldwide war on terror. Guantanamo wouldn't be the embarrassment that it is today, but we refuse to follow even those minimal um, rules that apply during wartime. Material support and terrorist organizations, I could talk about this for, this is a, one of the chief areas that I litigated in, I could talk about it for a long time, but I want to be brief. Basically, the administration can say who it wants uh, is a terrorist organization. There's, there's not even, there, there's a definition in the, in, in, in the law um, for one list of terrorist organizations, but the, the courts have basically said we can't review the, the, the executive branch determination that a group is a terrorist group. So it's a blank check. And on the other list, there's two lists, on the other list, the president just designates groups as terrorists without any criteria, uh, and then says any group that's associated with any group that I've just designated can be further designated as a terrorist without any criteria. And the process uh, is that you get a note, notice uh, published in the Federal Register saying your organization is a terrorist organization. And they close down your business and they seize all your records and then they say, you know, we've determined you're a terrorist organization. We did it on classified information. Go ahead and defend yourself. No uh, group has uh, thus far successfully defended itself. How does it affect Americans? Well, um, consider the case of Mohammed Salah, a Chicagoan. Uh, the, the, thus far, the only American citizen who has been designated a terrorist organization himself um, uh, actually designated by President Clinton, not by President Bush. Um, but what did that mean? Uh, it meant that Mohammed Salah gets a note that, you, that, that, that he's a terrorist. The president has determined that he's a terrorist. No charges, no hearing, no trial, nothing. He's designated a terrorist. And what happens when the president designates you a terrorist? Well, all your bank accounts are frozen. Uh, all your property is frozen. It becomes a crime for anyone to have any relation, financial relationship with you of any kind. So it's a crime for someone to sell him a loaf of bread. It's a crime for a doctor to treat him. It's a crime to, for someone to employ him. If this were enforced literally against him, he would starve to death. It's also a crime to give things of value to people or at groups that have been labeled terrorists. So it's an extremely broad uh, 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 measure which can, uh, uh, can lead to nightmare uh, scenarios quite, uh, quite easily. Uh, final question was, um, you know, how do we strengthen civil society and, and what else can we do? I, you know, I think, you know, um, I think we strengthen civil society by supporting the organizations that are out there, by joining uh, up with those organizations, by uh, uh, responding to their action alerts, by going out when there are uh, demonstrations by engaging in acts of resistance that stand up for uh, what America stands for at its best. One of the, one of the most uh, sort of moving moments for me um, in terms of sort of acts of resistance uh, occurred a couple of years ago at Georgetown, maybe a year ago, when Alberto Gonzalez came to defend the NSA program at, at, at Georgetown Law School. And I was in the room because I was going to respond to his defense. Uh, 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 and and, 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 and a, and a room like this, 120 students, path, room filled, cameras all in the back, and during the course of the Attorney General's speech, one by one, 20 to 25 students simply silently stood up, turned their back on the Attorney General, and, st and, and stood there. Didn't disrupt, didn't interfere, just stood up, turned around, and showed uh, their, uh, their protest. Five students in the back of the room stood up, put on Abu Ghraib-like hoods, and held up a sign saying those who sacrifice liberty for security deserve neither. And they held it up not to Attorney General Gonzalez, uh, but to the much more important audience, the TV cameras at the back of the room. And the photo op for that day in the administration's campaign to go out there and repeat the, you know, the, 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 the claim that the NSA program was legal so often that people might start believing it, the photo op for that day was the students holding up that sign uh, uh, with their Abu Ghraib hoods. And in the very small background, you see uh, Attorney General Gonzalez. 
Uh, and I said at the time, I thought it was the most civil act of civil disobedience that I'd ever witnessed. Uh, and, 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 and I got email. I, didn't, I had nothing to do with it. I just happened to be there. But because I said that, it, got, it went out on the web. I got emails from hundreds of people around the country, around the world, saying, you know, thank, please thank the students for standing up uh, to, to abuse of power. So, you know, I think small acts of resistance can make, uh, can make a very uh, big difference. And we need, to, um, we need to work with the groups that are out there and, and where there's a need for new groups, start new groups. But, you know, it is striking if you look back to the McCarthy era and say, what were the civil society groups doing then? First of all, most of the groups didn't exist. Um, uh, the ACLU was around, but, but it was purging itself of communists. It wasn't defending the communists. The National Lawyers Guild was one of the few groups in the National Emergency Civil Liberties Community were, were about the only two groups that were defending the communists on a regular basis. Um, uh, by contrast, today you've got uh, the human rights groups, you've got the immigrant rights groups, you've got the religious rights uh, groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations, uh, you've got the um, uh, the, the, the internet and uh, privacy groups, which I, I know weren't around 50 years ago because Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. Uh, and, and all these groups are doing, I think, in, and the ACLU, which is, now is doing incredible work uh, um, uh, standing up for the principles that we uh, stand for at our best. Okay, I think I, 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 my lengthy answers uh, exhausted uh, one of the questioners, so we have two questions. To no, no. Elisa, do you still unless want to you're stand just, up? Unless you're just resting. Okay, oh, okay. Um, with the confirmation of Michael um, Casey expected um, in the coming weeks, do you see any uh, substantive change that we can expect around the Justice Department? And secondly, on a case like that, um, given that a lot of these problems do have the, do have the capacity to be um, inherited across administrative or departmental lines, specifically taking into account that an election is going to be coming up in 2008, does, does the way in th the, these problems become inherited in fact, creating more difficulties. Yeah. Or and sort of what's the okay. Good. You used you used the term war in Iraq, and all of us are using that these days. But you and you know the Constitution far better than I. So my question is, how did we get? I, I realize how Congress is funding the war, but constitutionally, I thought only Congress could declare war. Can you help shed some light on that? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll answer those in reverse order, um, except I just forgot the first question. Uh, no, Mukasey, oh, well, oh yeah. So, 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 so it's, a, it's a wonder that I actually got hired as a professor, uh, given my inability to remember questions. But um, the thing is, once you're a professor, you get to ask the questions, you know. But, uh, so, so um, you know, Congress actually did, did declare war effectively with respect to Iraq. It gave um, uh, Bush an authorization to use military force. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton voted for it, uh, uh, and 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 it's and and so it was a it was a legal constitutionally authorized war. It was an illegal war under international law because we weren't attacked and that we faced no imminent threat of attack. But constitutionally, they went through the right. Uh, the right processes, you know, the question really is how do we get out of the war? And that's, you know, not so much a constitutional question as a pragmatic and a political question. Uh, is there the will? Uh, how do we get out without, uh, without creating more uh, damage? Um, um, uh, those, are, those to me are pragmatic, not uh, constitutional questions. It, Congress didn't declare war. That's true. But Congress hasn't declared war since World War II. And Declarations of war have largely gone out of fashion, uh, and instead what we have are these things called authorizations to use military force. But still, that's, a, that's at least Congress as a body authorizing the, the war to go forward. Um, and then the first question, uh, will Mukasey make a difference, and, and, uh, and, and what are going to be the long-term consequences of these kinds of measures? Well. I don't know whether Mukasey will make a difference. I kind of doubt it. In a, in a year and a half, he's not going to have a lot of time uh, to make a difference, and the, and the, and the problems are deep. Um, uh, uh, so, so I'm not holding out a lot of hope for Mukasey. Uh, I do think that a new administration uh, might make some significant changes. And, uh, and, and, and I think a new administration will have to make significant changes if we are going to begin to recover our standing uh, uh, in the world. And I think we'll have to do some dramatic things. Close Guantanamo, uh, set up a fair process for uh, adjudicating the status of, of Guantanamo, of the, d the detainees there. Not hide from the law, but defend what we're doing as lawful by creating a legal process uh, that is defensible. 
uh, rather than running from the law and trying to avoid it by uh, making arguments that the law does not apply. Uh, prohibiting uh, rendition to torture, uh, that seems like an easy one. Uh, uh, disavowing torture, investigating uh, uh, the, the, the cases of, of, the, of the victims uh, that there, there have been thus far. Um, uh, de, um, taking some of the money that we spend on military and, and directing it toward foreign aid programs and more positive ways of engaging the world. One of the you know, few Muslim countries where anti-Americanism actually dropped significantly for a period after 9-11 uh, is Indonesia. And the reason for that uh, is, is, is that after the tsunami, uh, President Clinton and former President Bush went over there and helped to organize uh, an aid effort. And we, spent, we, we, we put significant effort into that, into that foreign aid. And, the, and, and they saw us as not just exerting our authority through military might, but as actually uh, doing some good with our uh, incredible uh, power and our incredible uh, resources, and 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 the the world generally needs to see uh, to see that. So uh, you know, I, I think there are there are there are measures uh, that we uh, can do, and in fact, part three of our book is called an alternative preventive strategy. You know, directed towards the next administration on what you know what we can do to fight terrorism in a more effective, smarter way that doesn't um, have the counterproductive consequences that the act tough uh, 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 cowboy style of, uh, of President Bush and Vice President Cheney uh, has, has wrought. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take further questions at the back of the room uh, and sign books if people are interested.